Alrighty, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, bienvenue, bienvenidos a todos. If you'd like to open up your video and wave hello, this is an opportunity to do that. Please feel free to come in here and say hello to all of us. Join us in this conversation. My name is Anna, and on behalf of Force Space, I'd like to welcome you to the second event of the Seascape Poetics Project, the panel discussion on identity and migration. So welcome panelists, organizers, and all of the guests who have joined us today. Seascape Poetics was developed through the Beyond Museum Walls Curatorial Residency Program at the Curating and Public Scholarship Lab or Capsule at Concordia. And if you missed the virtual curator tour last week, I'll put a link in the chat of the video recording for you. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University and Fourth Space is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanyakahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past present and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. While it is not common practice to do a territorial acknowledgement in the Caribbean because of its complicated and diverse colonial history, we want to acknowledge the past and continued colonial histories and effects that exist in the region. We also want to acknowledge the deep pain still felt in the region through the effects of enslavement and forced colonial expansion. Thank you for joining us for the second in this series of three public events co-hosted by Capsule and Virtual Force Space. For those of you unfamiliar with us, there's um, a kind of image, a video image of Force Space here for you um, that you can check out. We're essentially, we're a Concordia University space where we collaborate with our community to make Concordia research initiatives, course activities, and um, and other kind of actions at the university publicly accessible through interactive experiences such as this one. So as a public space, we encourage open dialogue and discussion, and therefore the decision to run this event as a meeting, as opposed to a webinar, was taken with our collaborators to ensure that you benefit from all of the ways our distanced um, virtual interaction kind of allows for. So using your video, your audio, and your text in the Zoom meeting. Having said, having said that, Zoom meetings may be subject to interruptions, technical or via disruptive behavior. And if such an unfortunate interruption occurs, we will take immediate action. So in the unlikely event that this call fails or needs shutting down for whatever reason, we do invite you to please do lock back in and we'll continue. We're also currently recording the session and live streaming at CU Force Space on Facebook. So feel free to share the stream on your own page if you wish to do so. But if you're not, um, we, we, you can set your own view here if you're in the meeting to gallery or speaker. But for the recording, we're keeping the view pinned on our invited guests, the, the speakers. So even if your video is on, you won't appear in the recording. Okay, on that note, it's my great pleasure to pass proceedings over to Seascape Poetics Curator, Bettina Perez Martinez. Over to you, Bettina. Thank you so much, Anna. And, um... Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the second installment of the public Praga, <laughs> sorry, programming for the virtual exhibition Seascape Poetics. The exhibition was curated by myself, uh, Bettina Perez Martinez, and assisted by Simone Cambridge. We want to thank the Four Space for hosting uh, our exhibition and for offering technical support for this event. We would also like to thank World Creation Network for their 3D renders and web development for our online exhibition. We want to start off by introducing and explaining the song you just heard before our program started, Haya by Macha Colón y Los Ocapi. Macha Colón is the stage name for Puerto Rican filmmaker Gisela Rosario Ramos, and this character is inspired by Divine. And this song is about radical self-acceptance, showing love and compassion towards others despite social political adversities. What does Haya mean? As explained by Rosario Ramos, it is the feeling of confidence and the self-acceptance of being one with the universe. Haya symbolizes a form of radical self-love that overcomes societal barriers and allows you to feel completely comfortable and in tune with yourself. It provides a sense of happiness despite the systematic difficulties and the struggles many experience in the Caribbean. We think it is important to present this song before beginning our events and our podcast as a way of highlighting a sense of radical joy that persist in the Caribbean, despite the difficult and painful histories and themes we explore throughout this exhibition. So Seascape Poetics 
is developed uh, as a part of a curatorial residency program created by the Beyond Museum Walls Collective, which is part of Concordia University's Curating and Public Scholarship Lab. This is a 10 month curatorial residency where I had the great opportunity to work with an amazing group of curators, educators, artists, and historians to develop an exhibition and its public programming. The original proposal I presented to Beyond Museum Walls back in late 2019 was to create an in-person installation of exhibit artist Lionel Coetz Between Us Two um, in the First Space Gallery at Concordia. Unfortunately, as we all know, the coronavirus pandemic took hold of our entire lives in the beginning of 2020, which led to a dramatic shift for exhibition. The exhibition shifted from being an in-person exhibit to a hybrid model exhibit to a fully online exhibition, uh, which three of the artists exhibiting uh, as part of CCA Ho Poetics are here with us today. In today's event, we'll be talking about Caribbean diasporic identity and migration, as well as the degradation of natural resources, accelerated tourism, and diasporic performativity. We will be joined by curator Natalia Viera Salgado, an exhibiting artist in Seascape Poetics, Joey Di Minaya, Lionel Cuet, and Jeffrey Maris. For this exhibit, we'll first have a dialogue between Natalia and the artist that will be accompanied by images of the artist's work. Then it will be followed by a Q&A where audience participation is encouraged. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna present the artist bios and the curator bio, but the full versions are going to be in the chat if you wish to know more. So Natalia Viera Salgado was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico and has worked as a curator, researcher and curatorial consultant in Puerto Rico and New York City. Her art historical research focuses on contemporary art in relation to decolonial practices, architecture, social and environmental movements, and new media, with a keen interest in hybrid and multidisciplinary projects. Lionel Cuet is a multimedia artist born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and working in New York City and San Juan. His work, Flood Aftermath and Other Hurricane Stories, explores themes of ecology and geopolitics in the face of natural disaster and its impact upon the local population through its exploration of governmental ineffectiveness and what is left in a post-disaster landscape. Jeffrey Maris is an artist born in Haiti and raised in the Bahamas. His work considers the impacts of naturalization, displacement, and racial interpolation while considering transcendence. His work mouth-to-mouth -mouth circulates around ideas of the breath, buoyancy, and displacement in response to the capsizing of a Haitian immigrant vessel in the Bahamas in February 2019. Joydi Minaya is a Dominican United States multidisciplinary artist whose work investigates the female body within constructions of identity, multi multicultural social spaces, and hierarchies. Her work Labadi explores ideas of tropicalization and unethical forms of tourist practices and their ties to colonialism in the Caribbean through the interplay of social and economic dynamics in the island of Labadi, Haiti. Now I will pass over the mic to Natalia to start the artist talk. Thank you so much again for coming to this event and I hope you enjoy. Hi all, thank you, Bettina. Um, thank you so much for having me and letting me share the space with all of you and all of these wonderful artists. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to congratulate you, uh, you and your team uh, for such an amazing and refreshing project. Um, for this discussion, I would like to center um, the conversation around uh, three aspects that makes us understand each other in relation uh, to our similarities in the archipelago. So as Bettina mentioned before, um, I will focus on, on three aspects, the consciousness and degradation of our natural resources and extractivism, um, the awareness of, of the accelerated tourism industry in the Caribbean and our performativity and how our bodies operate uh, and how are we perceived in this space. Um, so I have cre created uh, guided questions for, for, these, um, for the artist. And maybe if we can start by uh, sharing the presentation. And um, yeah, uh, for, for the conversation, I wanted to discuss uh, 
this question or maybe pose this question on how would you define the Caribbean? And maybe we can start by, um, yeah, talking a little bit more about our uh, different uh, experiences in the Caribbean. So maybe uh, Jeffrey, um, Lionel and, and Joyri, one of you can answer that question first. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me and us, Natalia and Alex and Simone and Bettina and everyone at the Fort Space uh, that made this exhibition possible. And to everyone that's in attendance, thank you for being here with us. I, I think there's, there's like one, or at least in my mind, I think the most obvious answer for like that I think of when I think of what it means to be from the Caribbean is really our relationship to the water and to the sea. And I think that's both um, historically, geographically, culturally, politically, um, that continues to sort of shape our existence more or less. Because uh, being um, from an archipelago really presents a certain set of challenges Right. Um, in terms of in terms of the weather that we all have to fear, like every year there's hurricanes. Like that's a certain sort of um, that's a certain geographic challenge that I think is almost unique to the Caribbean in a lot of ways. I'm sorry. I think that's like a, a challenge that's unique to the Caribbean in a lot of ways. And and um, yeah. Sorry, I'm starting to ramble. So I think I'm gonna mm -hmm. let someone else speak. Yeah, maybe Joyri or, or Lionel wanna follow that? Yeah, to piggyback on that, I think our relationship to the landscape and, and nature around us mm -hmm. is pretty defining of, of the experience of being Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, and then cultural experiences. Like I feel that growing up in the Dominican Republic, I knew what the Caribbean was in theory, but you also, are very isolated in in that Caribbean experience. Like you know mm -hmm. that there's these other islands that share similarities with you, but you rarely get the opportunity to visit them because mm -hmm. those same like histories of um, colonization and imperialism have divided us in in ways that continue to um, happen. Like it's cheaper for me to fly to New York than to fly to like Trinidad and Tobago, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, it will take many more hours and much more money for me to get somewhere that is geographically closer um, because of the ways that, um, uh, yeah, contemporary systems uh, continue to divide us. Um, and then I, I also wanted to mention the Caribbean that I've discovered as the member of the diaspora, because precisely because of that um, isolation that we have geographically um, I didn't really get to know people like Jeffrey or like, you know, someone from the Bahamas in the Dominican Republic, or uh, we do have Puerto Ricans in the Dominican Republic and we have people from all over the Caribbean in the Dominican Republic, but you're just not as exposed to um, these people in the way that you are um, living in New York City, for example, which is like such a big um, diasporan hub for so many uh, locations, locations and, and the Caribbean has a lot of um people here and um yeah um influencing even like how neighborhoods in new york city have been shaped mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so it's it's also interesting for me to like expand that concept of the caribbean to places that are outside the caribbean precisely because uh we bring that culture mm -hmm. yeah i want to also comment on what um jeffrey and joey just mentioned that um it is also it is also an experience that um, take us throughout our life and to define um, you know how do we define the Caribbean as something that starts from a very early age, right? Um, for us, it's really uh, it's, it's it's I will say easier to be able to elaborate um, um, and to be able to express ourselves in regards to this, but. This comes from an early age, right? Like I think one of the things that helped me to define kind of like this this space and define myself within the Caribbean was to understand that I that I lived in an island, right? And to understand that the beach was not that 
place that we go just for joy, but it's, it's our limits, right? And, 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 and our geographical limits. And to be able to understand that in an early age, I think started to define a lot of things that relate to, to my identity. And I guess that's something that we all, I hope, and I guess that we all share too, mm-hmm. right? And there's different, there's different moments when you're confronted with this, with this reality of like defining what the Caribbean means for us and what, what, what it is in relation to everything else. I, I also want to add um, that I, I think that a lot of times when people think that think about the Caribbean, it, it seems to be sometime, somehow reduced to, you know, like leisure and tourism and sort of just whitewashes all of our collective experiences. So a lot of times when I think about the Caribbean, I think about a, a set of people with a really powerful, robust history um, and a sense of who they are and, and a sense of resilience is I think, you know, there's so many examples of how the Caribbean was a place that changed the world as we know it. And uh, cultural figures that uh, come out of the Caribbean either directly or through, um, through lineage. Thank you. Thank you all for your, your responses. Um, can we uh, go to the presentation and maybe we can start to talk a little bit more about the works that are presented in the show? Um, we can go to Jeffrey's work. Okay. Um, Jeffrey, do you want to give a little bit of the context um, to this work? And then I have a few, a few questions. Sorry, zoom mute. <laughs> I, the title of the sculpture is Mouth to Mouth. And I made this work in 2019. And this might answer your question that you have coming up for me a little bit, uh, Natalia, but I'll try to hold back. And so I, a lot of my work tends to start from an autobiographical place. When I made this work, I was 27 and 27 was this really uh, serendipitous year for me um, because my mother migrated to the Bahamas when she was 27 and uh, my father was a human trafficker. And so a lot of the work that I was making at the time was very interested in these narratives around immigration and around the water and my relationship to the water. And the February before I made this sculpture, the ship sank in the Bahamas that was carrying uh, 78 Haitians from Haiti to, to the Bahamas. And and uh, 34 bodies were uncovered, I believe. And that had a really visceral impact on me. I was living in New York at the time. And I remembered seeing footage of this huge truck that's meant to carry uh, like commerce, that's meant to carry merchandise and pallets of food, carrying bodies like that were wrapped up. and somehow I wanted to have a conversation with this using my practice. And I, I was at the time also very interested in, in these architectural systems of waste, right? The things like, what are things that we consider waste and also thinking about first world, first world, third world relations, like how, how the first world produces, uh, how the things that the first world produces end up affecting people living in the third world, i.e. the Caribbean the most, right? So all this, so if we think about climate change, the the people that are experiencing it at the highest rate are people that live in coastal areas like the Caribbean and how hurricanes are being accelerated. Um, I was in the Bahamas two months ago and I was on Abaco, one of the islands that was devastated by Hurricane Doreen almost three years later and and it's still a ghost town, sorry, two years. And it's still a ghost town, like all of the buildings are completely dilapidated. So thinking a lot about the relationship between um, the climate, the body, migration, 
um, and more specifically, in some ways, creating a monument or a memorial to these, these people who were all buried and none of their names were recited. And, and then the title obviously suggests the body. It suggests resuscitation, like what would it look like for a country like the Bahamas and Haiti, countries like the Bahamas and Haiti to actually address this immigration uh, conversation in a way that's not filled with xenophobia and anti-Blackness and the baggage of colonialism. Thank you. Um, and I had an, another question that maybe has to do a little bit more about your your work uh, presented in in your gallery. But um, can you talk a little bit more about uh, your relationship to migration and the restorative uh, reparative process of of creating your work? Um, I'm thinking a lot about healing practices and care. Um, and do you ever think about healing in your work? Yeah, so I am gonna share my screen with y'all for a second. La, la, la. Sorry, my computer is very junky. So, I think so the work that I was making prior to, so mouth to mouth comes from that body of work where I was very interested in, in understanding sort of the traumas that I've lived with all of my life, um, both personally, collectively as like an immigrant in America and also as someone from the Caribbean. And I've made other works where I was really interested in like understanding the violence of race uh, and that way of being in the world. And I'm currently doing a fellowship at Next Haven based in New Haven, Connecticut. And since being here, I realized that I needed to, I, knew, I realized that I was less interested in sort of monumentalizing trauma because oddly what that does is it, I think it privileges whiteness in a really odd way. And so, uh, my practice has shifted a bit to, I think, talk about regenerative processes and to, and to try to address healing, um, but not healing in a way that, not healing in a way that's like, don't talk about the things that hurt you. Instead, like trying to use the work to, to, to understand, understand all these things. And so what you're looking at right now is a show, an exhibition that I currently have up right now at White Columns in New York, New York. Uh, I highly recommend that you check it out if you're around. And these paintings in the background, uh, they're made using, so I had this body of work that I made, these sculptures that I made that are all kinetic. And, and the idea is that the sculptures destroyed um, these body casts of my body that I made. And the cast, the sculptures were, mostly made out of steel and steel doesn't like oxygen or hydrogen. So essentially what that did was it caused the sculptures to rust. And I realized that the rust was acting as this metaphor for trauma in some ways for hurt. Um, and when I started this residency at Next Haven, what I did was I used the first two months just trying to fix and restore the steel back to its original state. And so what you're looking at is uh, terry rags or painter's clots and acid, acetic acid. It's a very mild acid that removes rust. And so I spent the, the first two months at Next Haven just cleaning off my sculptures. And eventually I realized that this was not just cleaning off sculptures. In some ways I was enacting the same rituals of sort of care and kindness that I enact on my body every day, right? I go home and I take a shower, I wake up and I take a shower, I brush my hair, I clean my teeth. In some ways, that same, those same acts of kindness and love was happening in these sculptures, in these paintings, sorry. And, and I was also interested in sort of like thinking about um, if there could be a, a, a understanding of an ecological, turning something ecological into something visual, because this, this really was 
in some ways mapping that storage unit that I had in New Jersey, but also thinking about the Bahamas, right? Because if you don't paint your car, if you don't paint your car every several years or something like that, it rusts, right? If you have to repaint your, your house every so often, there's a lot of care that goes into, into maintaining property in the Bahamas. And I would imagine other places like the Caribbean. And then one last thing that I, I'll say about these works, um, they do appear to be very skin-like or like hides. Um, so I'm also thinking about Junkanoo, which is a festival in the Bahamas that has um, pre-transatlantic slave routes. So this is one of those things that immediately bind us to West Africa and it's still celebrated today. And uh, goat skins are stretched, coat and cow skins are stretched over drums and we use these in festivals. So, and my practice, my visual practice is very informed by John Canoe, So I wanted to sort of nod to that. Sorry, I spiraled a little bit there, but... Uh, and you can spend more time with my work on my website. Thank you. And your show also, which is up. And my show, White Columns, Yeah. 91 Horatio Street. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Um, can we go back to the uh, presentation and um, we'll move to Joydi's work. And Joydi, can if you can talk a little bit more about um, Lavadi and how you decided to pursue this project, and then I have other questions also for you. Sure. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Joydi Minaya. I'm based in um, New York City, but I grew up in the Dominican Republic. And um, Lavadi is a video that I ended up doing in a kind of uh, serendipitous way. Um, my mom wanted to celebrate my uh, younger sister's quinceañera uh, party in a cruise, which is a thing um, that it's like a service that some companies of offer to like do this whole celebration with your family in a cruise. And it's really odd because there's other quinceañeras having their party. So it's like a bunch of 15 year old turning, um, uh, young people who um, don't necessarily know each other, but they're all celebrating their birthdays together. It's really strange. Um, so that's the the setting in which I would I ended up in this um, type of space. Um, I'm not a fan of all inclusive experiences. I I prefer to do other types of things with my leisure time, but. Um, I was living in New York and my family lives in the Dominican Republic. So I, it was a good opportunity to kind of see them and spend time with them. Um, so I accepted and then I brought my camera because I um, anticipated that this type of space would give me some sort of like research material. Um, and then I ended up um, shooting in like several of the stops of the crew. So like it, it goes to, I think, four different places. There's different routes and different um, lengths, but that one stopped in four places in the Caribbean. And um, Labadee was the one that was, that ended up being the most interesting um, because the other spaces where we, the other places where the cruise went to um, were places where you can have a, a more independent experience. Like you could, um, go to the beach and find a local taxi. And um, if you did some previous research, which I did, um, we could go to a museum or like go see something that was of like your particular interest for um, those three, four hours in which the, the cruise is docked and um, come back in time to depart and go to the next place. But Labadee was a place where um, this cruise company advertised a day at the beach. And um, it's, a, it's a beach that is fenced off and that um, you can only access if you get into this cruise basically, or if you maybe own your private yacht or something, but um, it, it, it's not like a free access sort of space. And in fact, the only, um, people that were locals that I saw um, there were people who worked for the cruise company and I had talked to them and um, 
some of them uh, told me that they had to pay a fee to even be in there performing or selling their merchandise to Royal Caribbean if they didn't work directly uh, with the company. Um, so Labadee is a, um, a, a private space that is located in Haiti. And um, I was also thinking about like my own relationship uh, with Haiti, having grown up in the Dominican Republic and being right next to it, but so distant with all of this, um, I guess, historic and um, colonial obstacles that have been placed between both nations. Um, and how ironic it was that I had to like go to Florida to get on a cruise to go to the other side of the island in which I grew up. Um, so those are not things that are necessarily at the center of the video, but those are things that I was thinking about while making it. Um, what's at the center of the video is the, the interactions between the tourists and the space around them and the locals who are working inside of this uh, private space and also the relationship of the people who are inside the private space and people who you see outside of the fences and the walls um, outside of this private space and how the people outside are a reminder of how what is this fantasy that is sold in the inside is only a fantasy and that is uh, not sustainable and actually not even benefiting the local people. Um, and what else did I want to say about Labadee? Labadee starts with, it has subtitles that start with um, sentences that I, um, I took from Christopher Columbus's diary in the parts where they were talking about first seeing, uh, seeing land for the first time in 1492. Um, and those sentences are paired with, um, with footage of the open sea. So it kind of um, has that relationship, but it also brings um, ties into this contemporary touristic experience to that colonial history and um, trying to point out that how those are directly kind of informed or you know directly um, one coming from the other. Uh, and then at some point in the video, it switches to the subtitle switch to kind of narrate or guide the um, what you're seeing in the camera in that moment, that more contemporary moment. And, and the video ends uh, with subtitles that go back to that colonial relationship with footage of um, people swimming at the beach. And um, the subtitles say something like, I wonder how many bodies have floated on these waters, um, but the sea doesn't keep count. So um, kind of a reminder again of that um, history of extraction, slavery, exploitation, colonialism. Um, in relation to this supposedly, um, you know, superficial and uh, innocuous sort of experience. And yeah, I don't know if that was a good introduction to the video. Uh, um, no, I had a question about, you know, your work uh, deals a lot with um, the representation of the Caribbean landscape and oftentimes in, other works, um, you you talk about this idea of being at the service of the other, um, the tourist, um, and we think about the tourism industry and capitalist and ne neoliberal practices. How do you think this power dynamics operate from your point of view as uh, someone from the Caribbean diaspora? Yeah, a, a lot of my work um, outside of Lavadi is also considering these ideas of like service and and kind of the labor that is behind maintaining this uh, surface of tropical, um, I don't know, leisurely space and space of relaxation. Um, and a lot of what I'm trying to do with my work is um, kind of embodying those expectations to a certain degree, but in that embodiment, um, insert some 
kind of strategic agency or some way of taking back or having control and, and showing that control or um, some way of deconstructing or fragmenting this um, expectation in a way that the viewer kind of sees themselves probably and, and needs to reflect on like what is their position in relation to what I am um, showing and offering and um, perhaps you're also Caribbean and you understand these things perhaps you are from the global north and then you are in the position of possibly a potential consumer of these things in the way that they are offered and then you have to like um, you know well, wonder or like meditate on how you may be participating in these industries how you may be perpetuating some of these dynamics and um that's that's what i'm interested in in many of my works in, including Labadi. um i wanted to mention that Labadi was first shown in in the bahamas in a show that was uh organized at the um NAGB, National Art Gallery of the Bahamas, um, in 2017. And I was excited to show it there for the first time because it, even though it was filmed in um, Haiti, it echoes a lot of the dynamics that happen in a space like the Bahamas. And at the same time, a space like, uh, uh, these spaces exist in a lot of places in the Caribbean. So part of the Caribbean experience that a lot of Caribbean people will recognize is also that tourist industry, whether you participate directly in it or not. And um, that's something that we all need to negotiate and hopefully meditate on to shape in a more sustainable and um, equitable and just uh, just way, fair way for like um, everyone who participates in it. Because right now how it's set up is basically these are extractive companies, extractive practices that uh, benefit mostly foreign people really because the owner of uh, the owners of cruise companies are not local the owners of a lot of all-inclusive resort resorts are not local and even like smaller boutique resorts that are kind of um, popping up and that are um, kind of like a trend now in around the Caribbean and probably other places that are like selling themselves as more sustainable and whatever when you go there it's usually owned by like a French expat or like a, an Italian expat. And then I'm, I'm also curious of this word expat and how it relates, it relates to the idea of immigrant and why are you not called immigrant, but expat, but whatever. Um, but the thing is like, it, there's still like this um, coloniality that seeps into, um, you know, contemporary spaces in a way that we're not always um, critical of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joidi. Um, and now we can uh, go to Lionel's work, or you can show a little bit more of uh, yeah, the work. For anyone interested um, and who haven't, hasn't seen the, the exhibition, um, you can go and uh, experience it yourself, see scapepoetics.com, um, I think, I believe. Um, so uh, yeah, Lionel, can you talk a little bit more about this work? And um, and um, I'm, I'm talk a little bit more about how uh, your understanding of, of these forces in the Caribbean, and I'm talking about environmental, colonial, systemic, um, and how all of these forces have informed your work. Um, in relationship to the Caribbean landscape and uh, the production of space, which is something that you are always um, interested in. Yes, um, thank you, Natalia, and thank you everyone for being here and for um, you know listening to our dialogue and to our presentation and looking at our work. Um, so yes, so the series that are being exhibited here as part of CSPAKE but it is um, this series that is called Flood Aftermath and Other Hurricane Stories. And I want to start with the title because it was something that I um, worked on uh, for quite some time. And it was a lot of like deep introspection and how I was weaving some sort of uh, this, the, the title with the representation of the work. Um, and 
one of the things that that we all know that remains um, after uh, you know hurricanes or floods or sort of like all of this um, climate effects is stories, right? And how we narrate those stories are part of our of our own identity, right? And uh, and, and about the ways that we carry on with different things on the daily basis. So that was something that I wanted to reflect um, through the work. Um, and there's two different aspects that you ask in here in regards to this question. And one of the um, one of the ask one of those is 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 uh, I want to uh, focus it specifically on the politics and the other one on the on on the natural environmental um, aspect, which both of them um, are considered with the work. And when I when I uh, when I talk about uh, politics, of course, is something that um, touches upon this ideas of like um, just uh, public politics and how how people work within those active spaces, and um, that is in a way like work within the representation, but also more more in the specific with the materials that are being used. So when I was creating uh, this series, this series started in 2015 and was part of a research project that I was doing um, while I was attending this residency program. And um, I was working with all of these archival images and talking about this idea of like, uh, you know, this narrative of disaster that people talk about um, and, and, and focusing in this natural events as, as right with this narrative of disaster because people focus in what they have lost, right, instead of like the the emotions and all of the other aspects that are the myriad of aspects that relate to to oneself. Um, and I am from Puerto Rico and living through different hurricanes and floods and all of these things, you're at the mercy of, 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 of this natural um, effects and this natural cycles. And understanding those is, 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 is also Something that is reflected to the work, but back to the to the idea of the material, um, one like the decision on painting on top of this of this uh, blue polyethylene tarp is because uh, I wanted to make reference to this political act that exists when you know when natural disasters happen, and this happened in Haiti when the um, when the earthquake happened, where you know they deployed this like massive amount of of blue tarps to people to sort of construct this temporary spaces. Uh, to live and to shelter themselves, but at the end of the day, this this is not something that is for an immediate. This is something that happens immediately as a as a as a uh, yeah as a as a fast sort of response. But then it becomes something prolonged, right? Like just you you have this landscape of of a temporary sort of uh, architecture and shelter spaces that are that are created from this you know for this material, this blue tarp. And the same thing happened in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And when I started this series again, it was in 2015. Hurricane Maria happened in 2017. And when I was creating this, it was very conflicting for me right after that because I was tied up with a lot of um, emotions that was happening, and specifically, you know, to narrative and things that relate to my family and to people that I knew. And I just stopped creating the work. And that's why there's only from 2015, there's only four pieces that were made that are slightly different from these ones. And then in 2020, starting on 2020, I started sort of um, looking looking at it again and re-engaging not only with the material, but with the imagery. And this one I wanted to focus instead of having this house sort of stranded in the in the in the landscape, wanted to work with this idea of like this landslides or sort of like this this grounds or this landscape that seem to be um, unstable. So part of the imagery touches upon that. The other thing that um, that I work in here was that it, it became very difficult and I'm, I'm thinking and, and um, piggybacking on what um, Jeffrey said, it's just the, the this act of care that you have with the work. Um, when I created these, there, there was a combination. I created it with a with a paint with a paint. There was a, a combination between acrylic and house paint, and of course, on top of a plastic material is gonna, in a way, like we are at the mercy of like deterioration if it's not taken care of properly, and you know, part of like the narrative also too is all of the small little pieces and fragments of this image that it starts sort of disappearing, and this this parts of of the materials and the um, the materials that are being used were carefully thought. I 
do a lot of research, very profound research that takes an extended amount of time to choose the material. So it's not in the imagery that is projected. And it's not something that is just like um, a, a one-time emotion. It's something that I really um, think. Uh, the other aspect that we see here in terms of the image is this um, sort of illuminated spaces that are inside of the structures. And I think about this in a, in, in both in a, in a, in a, in a, in the, in a way of, in the way of how the image is created and in the aesthetics of it, but also in a more conceptual way, just thinking about all of that um, energy that lies within this shelter spaces and, and, you know, energy also talking about just power and the lack of it or the, the absence of it. So creating some dynamics between that is something that I was, that I was definitely interested. I don't know if I answered the question, but I went into <laughs> a lot of explorations here. No, you, this is great, Aliana, and uh, thank you for sharing all of the, the aspect of creating the work. Um, but I wanted to ask a question for all of us, because I think that we've talked um, or we've touched upon the idea of the Caribbean landscape, but um, I wanted to ask about what is your relationship to water to the three of you, um, because I think it's a an important topic um, in this exhibition and also by the fact that we are so like you know we're separated from our countries and how I mean for I can speak for myself um, and you know how important water is for me as a um, you know if you think about healing or you know other uh, practices but yeah what is uh, what is it about water or what is your relationship about um, with water okay so I can go uh, I so while I was in grad school I realized that I was making all of this work in and around the ocean and the sea and the water and the black people, you know, and I thought to myself during a studio visit, and this is going to sound kind of ridiculous, but it's going to make sense. And I thought to myself during a studio visit, like, this is kind of, it, it's, 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 it's fake, right? Because I'm making this work around the water and I don't know how to swim. And I, the following semester, fall 2018, I took a swimming class at Columbia and I was the only grad student in that class. And it was all undergrads and then mostly junior, senior year because at Columbia, in order to get an undergrad degree, you have to take a swimming class. It's like some weird Ivy League BS unless you're an engineering student because engineers build bridges. Uh, so I took that class every Monday and Wednesday. I'm not the best swimmer in the world, uh, but I learned how to swim while I was in grad school in New York, even though I'm from the Caribbean. And I think that's I, like, as funny as that is, there's a sad reality to it. There's so many, I, there's, so many people from the Bahamas that don't know how to swim, right? We, we are afraid of the water. My mom never took us to the beach because she's afraid of the water. And maybe that might have something to do with like, you know, our historical relationship to it. Um, maybe that has something to do with access to beaches, right? Um, I know in Haiti, for instance, and I think that's why Jordi's piece is so powerful, you know, unless you're wealthy, like a lot of the beaches even, there's no, there's not really a public beach. You have to pay to go on the beach. And, right, and one of the wet, poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere, what does it mean then to make a country of millions of people pay to go to the beach, right? Yeah, to piggyback a little on what Jeffrey uh, was saying, I, um... I also kind of took a swimming class in the US. I, I learned how to swim like, you know, um, self-taught, I guess, as I was younger. But I was I never had the confidence of like, yes, I can, you know, handle these waters. 
uh, until I took that swimming class. Um, but I, I, I did grow up with access to, to the water and um, that's interesting to learn about Haiti. I've, I've heard something similar from other places. The Dominican Republic has a strange like gray situation where like you do have public beaches, but like they're usually not taken care of very well. So people, um, if you have if you have access, you would want to, um, as you say, pay for a more exclusive experience of a beach. And then there's also weird. Um, I think there's a law that says that you can access any beach, but they define beach as like the from a certain distance from the shore. It's public access. But then resorts take over and uh, private spaces take over and like build walls and like kind of deny that access with obstacles. And, and it's funny because like they sometimes pay like a, a security guard with a gun that is like standing on the edge of their private space. And people are kind of, um, um, what's the word? Uh, well, I guess, taught or, or used to not go beyond where the security guard is but you could actually just cross it's just like a visual and and kind of like psychological obstacle um that is present in a lot of these spaces but um yeah we have a uh, like a really contentious relationship to uh public access and um spaces where people can have uh space and time for leisure even rivers are sometimes uh commodified and um privatized like um there's public areas but then uh those are usually again not not taken care of uh very well um when i think of my relationship to water i think of uh buoyancy a lot um just that feeling of of floating and not feeling the weight of your body um and I feel like when I go back to the Dominican Republic, um, that's something that I, I look forward to, uh, especially now that I live away from it. But even when I lived and, and grew up there, I it's something that I always um, really enjoy, especially of uh, sea water, not necessarily rivers, um, but um, the beach. And um, I think maybe subconsciously that kind of seeps into my work in a way or another. I mean, Labadee is obviously very obvious, the relationship to water there and how that um, has to do with like, it's looking into um, colonial history and, and contemporary tourism. But um, in other works, um, there's this like vast field of blue that kind of gets repeated throughout um, many of my works. And I think that is thinking about that, um, landscape of the water and um and it's also like if you think of caribbean landscapes it's either green or blue it's either water based or uh flora based um and that's like a super you know um superficial way of like um kind of uh uh what's the word Portray. Yeah, portray maybe the the Caribbean space, but um, flattening is what I was uh, thinking about. Uh, flattening that, but it's it's also like a continuity uh, across time from like where you have like this explorers um, prints of like etchings of describing landscape to what we sell today in um, tourism advertisement. It's it's usually tied to either waterscape or landscape so that's also interesting that is like super present even if you um don't necessarily have access to water uh to the degree that you wish it's, it's something that is visually present even if you don't even live near water yeah and then i want to continue with also what both of you said i think um I mean, my relationship to water can start from something very scientific. And one of them is that, you know, there's an origin, there's an end and there's a cycle, right? And those, um, water is extremely politicized and it doesn't matter if we're talking about a river, if we talk about just, you know, the, the, the ocean or the, or the beach, 
it is completely politicized because that's our natural being, that's our natural selves. And I think um, this is not maybe a condition that is only specific to one place. This is something that has become a glo of global concern. And um, we, in a way, like, in a way that the, the understanding of all of this is, is, is what is the, what is our relationship to water? There's people that think about water as leisure, water is something that gives us life, water is something that is lacking or that is available in some places. And then I'm very, very interested about that, about those relations that, that, that water as an, as an element creates. Um, but I also, it, it automatically makes me think that, the, of course, like the, 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 there's a relationship between a river, between the origin of a river to whatever comes out in the, in the, in the beach, right? Um, and this sometimes take like miles of like rivers or sometimes there's shorter distances um, and it's an ebb and flow. There's a, there's, a, there's a cycles and systems in there. And that is something that is really beautiful. And that's where I start my relationship with it. Um, there, there is also, uh, we create our own emotional relationship to water, right? Between one that is extremely forceful that can definitely kill you, but one that is giving you life as well because we are part of it. And that is, some, that is also another perspective that I want to open in here that um, it's, it's, it's an essential part, but sometimes becomes invisible in our, in our, in our, in, you know, in our immediate um, perspective. Um, and also we have also in, in created an invisible system behind the ways that we um, utilize water on our daily basis, right? We don't, we don't know sometimes like where this water goes out to be filtered, how do we use it? How do we consume it? How it comes back? And sometimes these things are extremely um, obscure, sometimes are more transparent, um, but it's extremely politicized. And I like to see water and my relationship to water from that you know, point of departure, I think is a way to, to, to understand it better. Um, and also to understand what happens, what happens around it. Yeah. yeah, I also wanted to add in, in terms of like that invisible system and how we don't think of like how the water comes to us. Um, I feel especially for me after um, coming to the States, that's something that has fallen to the background in a way, because it's like you open the tap, you drink from it. But in the Dominican Republic, you can't drink the water from the tap. So um, water was something that was always like very... Uh, people are very self-aware like are you washing those vegetables with tap water because you need to use this other water or like you know not to do that or you know what water you can drink and which not um, and and also I feel my experience is very privileged not only through living in the global north and, and that type of access to water but also um, growing up in the Dominican Republic growing up in, in the capital city as opposed to like my grandma or my mom who have stories of being in the countryside and like walking miles for getting water and things like that. But um, uh, that's still kind of present in, in that kind of oral history and in that memory that I can imagine. It's not my personal memory, but I can, it's something that is part of my family. But um, again, it's not something that I get to think about a lot because of my current surroundings. I, I wanna uh, sort of respond to Lina. Lionel's uh, comment about invisible systems, or well, Lionel and Jory. I mean, this has less to do with water, but um, when I when I was making the installation of mouth to mouth, one of the things that I was actually thinking about was um, how waste disposal is like this invisible thing. It's almost like, you know, you put your things out on the street and hopefully tomorrow morning, you don't have to look at it, right? Uh, but like just the privilege of, of, um, I mean, that, that has a lot to do with government and taxes and all of these other things, but I really was thinking about, I think for me, um, plastic as a material, sorry, I'm shifting away from water, but plastic as a material, um, when I was thinking about the things that I grew up with in the Bahamas, right, the sort of signifiers of what it meant to be um, from a low income neighborhood in the Bahamas, oddly one of the materials that at the time stood very true to me was plastic. Um, and that's kind of, that's really sad actually, uh, thinking about how we didn't have running water in my home and you would have to save the water gallons that you would use for milk and orange juice and all of these other things 
suddenly those things become reused and that's how you store water. Um, luckily, I grew up in a country where the water that the government provided was portable. Um, and so you would go to these public pumps and fill up your water gallon. So thinking about that relationship in, in connection to how in New York, these things are being put out on the street at night and, and um, either someone's gonna come and collect that and try to sell that for, for a little bit of money or it just disappears. And if it does disappear, where does it end up? Thank you. Um, so I, I had another question and this is like shifting um, from water, but, um, and then I'll open it up for, for uh, a discussion and questions from the public because we've been getting uh, some of them here in the chat. Um, but I am curious to know, um, what are your opinions about the, uh, about the idea of trop tropicalization in the Caribbean? And if you have any kind of res uh, resistance to the to the term, I I definitely have some resistance to the term, um, and um, and I've expressed that through previous works because um, I feel it it's often. Uh, utilized for for this like superficial um again flattening of, of identity to make it commodifiable um and not necessarily thinking about like the actual tropical environment and like what is how can we use that to our service even when it's like thought about from like an environmentalist point of view that knowledge and, and tools and ideas usually come from the outside and it's linked to some sort of um way where things are still controlled by this like foreign agent as opposed to um, a local or, or a, a person who is based in, in the tropical space. Um, I think that if it's used with, with that awareness and, and trying to shift that and um, put the agency in, in local space, I think it's um, an interesting term, but um, the way that I that I come to that term and, and how I've become familiar with it has been through um, these ideas of the picturesque and these ideas of like making uh, imagery of tropical space for the purposes of, of commercial and, and consumption. Um, yeah, for the purposes of, of consumption. But I don't know, and maybe, maybe someone else like Lionel or, or Jeffrey have a different relationship to the term. So I, I uh, la, la, how do I think about this? So I, I think for a very long time in my life, not, I mean, not that long <laughs> because I haven't been alive that long, but uh, I sort of rejected um, a lot of notions around like, right, being sort of exoticized in that way. And even in this sort of aesthetic choices, the aesthetic and conceptual choices I was making in my work, I tried for a very long time to be like, you know, this is, this is um, not, uh, and I don't know, I, I, I feel, I do know actually, I'm sorry. I feel as though a lot of it has to do with uh, sort of these feelings of not being um, good enough or adequate. Um, and I've since tried to think about what it means like to be from a place as like the Caribbean as something empowering and not, not thinking about it as being like some inherent lack, not looking at people saying that I have an accent as being something that is relational to my way of being in the world or my way of presenting. I am trying to sort of like reshift because I feel as though growing up, that's definitely the way that I learned it. And it's it has a lot to do with uh, decolonizing and unlearning all of these systems of damage that are uh, ingrained in the way that we see ourselves. Um, and I'll say one more thing. I don't think that um, 
aesthetically, I'm particularly interested in, in that um, in an explicit way, but I'm sure it comes up in different ways in my practice. Yes, I think um, the word was tropicalization, right? Is that correct, yes. Natalia? Yes. Yeah, it's not the tropical in the Caribbean. Right. So I think there's there's two ideas there and two concepts, right? A tropical is just a condition, right? It's a, it's a, it's a term that has been um, connected with ideas of conditions to climate and to a certain aspect of the landscape and to that environment that is that is that is um, quite a specific, right? Um, and, and to be tropical, it is something that is, again, global, right? It's not something that is only tied up to the Caribbean. There are some aspects in there that are very particular to those, which is, of course, temperature, certain climate cycles, certain vegetation, and certain um, specific uh, um, signifiers of those areas. But it's something that is shared globally as well. So understanding that is something um, that is really, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, that, that a term that relates to climate and a term that relates to a certain um, um, geographical area that is shared um, has been taken into another into another level. And I think the way that we're discussing it here is not necessarily from that sense of like the etymology of the word or, or, or how scientific it is, but um, I think it has it has been a term that has been used to extract, right? And to use with with the means of what Joidi is saying to be used to um, create some sort of um, discourse around tourism and to be able to sell something to someone. And when when it, when those dynamics come in there, now the word has multiple meanings. And I'm 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 very particular particularly interested about that because there's some fantasies that are created within that, and the landscape is at the service of that, right? How can how can the landscape can be created like human manipulate? <laughs> human manipulated to create some sort of expectations with certain things. And I think maybe um, as a Caribbean experience, that is something that we all that we all share, right? And I want to be very explicit with this, right? Like the the areas that are completely populated of of of, um, of palm trees, for example, or you know, the manipulation of certain areas to have like rivers that people can like swim in, for instance. And you know, all of these things create a certain idea of this tropical, you know, quote unquote space that is that is not necessarily related or where the origin of the word um, became, right? Which is something that is related more to um, a certain temperature and a certain climate condition that is desirable, let's say, right? So I'm interested about like that, the, the, the origin of things. And this is the way that I, that I usually work when I embark with like a project, I like to think about um, words, where they come from, what they relate, how pe what people understand um, now, what people understand before, and how that relates to our current our current our current situations. And and, and this term of tropical um, has been is, is is of interest definitely because it relates to these ideas of us seeing um, our last our um, landscape and our relation to it. And I'm interested about that. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it also, um, as you said, Lionel, it, it relates to this like global experience of being situated in the tropics, right? But and then I think to me, something that is always interesting in, in having that conversation is like how a lot of those spaces have gone through a similar process of colonization as places in the Caribbean and how a lot of the contemporary mechanisms through which they are made interchangeable in this global north imaginarium in the sense of like, how the same type of um, decoration and like uh, visuals are used for very different places. I think it's an extension of, of that colonial history. And I think it's interesting that it all goes back to that tropical um, condition, as you say. Thank you. So now I will go to the chat and um, read some of the questions. Um, I have one question for Lionel uh, from Alex Santana. Um, Lionel, I was just going to ask if you ever imagined installing these paintings in other contexts. I imagine them blowing in the wind of a storm. Thank you, Alex. Um, yes, uh, in terms of thinking about installing them in different places or with different environmental conditions, definitely. Um, there, there are some tests that I have done installed in different places and um, 
perhaps like houses that has been tear apart because of hurricanes. Um, and it is, it, it definitely changed the meaning and makes it, um, let me, let, how, how do I say it? Because I think the space of, of within an institution or within a museum or a gallery where they have been shown before, um, sort of um, create a different, a different reading or a different understanding of how the audience engage with it. But I'm not opposed to any ideas because the work don't exist within a museum. Um, they exist within certain ways of like rolled up or folded up or they're, you know, in a, in a person's home or they're in a, in a storage. So they exist in different spaces. And I think um, considering that is, is, is super interesting and considering in relation to whatever can trigger them is, is something, something super, super interesting, super interesting. And I have tried something, but definitely that could be something that, um, that I can um, do too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have another question. I think this is for you, but I, I feel that everyone else can, you know, chime in. Um, from Alex Santana uh, again, what do you think about water futures being traded on to the stock market? How does climate change sacredly present itself in your work? I think the stock market situation is terrifying. When I read that, I was like, what on earth is going on? Um, I don't I don't have further thoughts about that. It's just like, what is the world coming to? Um, but also like, what would be the implications of that to, again, a place like the Caribbean? You know, like I, I haven't followed up with that. I don't know if that's actually like, was that only a suggestion? Is that actually being implemented? Like what, what is the current situation of that? Thoughts? If not, I can uh, follow the next question. I I I I, I want to just say really quickly. Um, I also do not. I uh, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to be more conscious of is financial literacy. Um, because I think too often artists, uh, we like to be like, my job is to make art. I'm not going to talk about the money, right? Um, right now, I'm not in a position where I could speak about the stock market or more particularly water stock market, but I could say that um, just personally, I think it's unfathomable to be charging people for water. Like, I think that should be illegal. Um, uh, I, I really... Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I don't even like buying bottled water because I'm a cheapskate like that. Uh, but I think in terms of uh, climate change and how I think my work is in conversation with that, um, like it's proven that climate change is producing um, this sort of influx in, in people that are just looking for a safe place to live well, we won't be terrorized by natural disasters and other effects. And yeah, that's something that I think about consistently in my work. Sorry, I'm not so eloquent with that answer just now. Uh, Alex said uh, she wants to clarify she doesn't care about the stock market and she just meant like how they can profit off scarcity. Um, and I wanted to quickly say, like, I, I also don't have a lot of financial literacy, as Jeffrey says, uh, and I don't understand the entire implications of that. It just sounds very scary. But also when you put it like that and like benefiting from scarcity in terms of water, growing up in an island where all you drink is bottled water, it's like we're already conditioned to mm -hmm. that. Like there's no way that we can drink tap water. So for many years, and I don't know what's the history of bottling water in the Dominican Republic, but for many years, this has been the case, at least for my whole life. So maybe if I compare it to that, it's not such a foreign idea. However, it's still very scary. Yeah, I think about I think about also um, if this becomes something more of a general like practice. Let's say this idea of the stock market and how we want to trade 
um, when it comes to water, this will definitely produce much more division when it comes to social classes. And that is something that is happening again globally um, and more specific into certain areas. And I think this can only, you know, produce a lot of social instability. And I don't know if us as humans were prepared for something like that um, because it is something it is something to understand already like the bottled water or to understand the water that comes from the tap and to understand all of this filtering processes and how this relates to nature because we're talking about an element that is strictly related to 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 what we consider nature in our biosphere so um, understanding the process of how can we like monetize in regards to this. I don't know if, if people are necessarily like structured in that sense to be able to create something like this. And if they are, it will be absolutely bizarre and I will be really scared about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have some raised hands. Um, Simone Cambridge had a question. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being on this panel. And my question is for Jeffrey. Um, you mentioned, uh, you used this phrase, the baggage of colonialism. And I was wondering in the way that you talk about water and the way that you talk about waste and plastics, um, how you draw a connection from this, which seems so contemporary to um, what you call the baggage of colonialism. Right. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if, if, if the way that I, I would think about the baggage of colonialism would, or at least maybe I might try to work my way through this answer as I speak and forgive me again, if, if it's not coherent, but when I think about the baggage of colonialism, I think um, like some of the most immediate things that come to mind is 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 all of these sort of micro um, wars that are happening into national inter island international? Um, as someone that grew up of Haitian ancestry in the Bahamas, like I I I I think I think of xenophobia, of classism, of anti-blackness i i think of all of those things as being like those are things that we learned from the colonizers and uh how do we sort of navigate or how do we well for me how do we uh sort of unlearn that and how do i stop seeing a haitian and forgive me how do i stop seeing a haitian as all of the things that i learned that a haitian was growing up um growing up as a person in the bahamas sorry i'm this is like a really touchy subject for me so <laughs> i mean but but when i think about the baggage of that and and then also being in america right um you you have this certain narrative that of what it means to be a black person in this country right anti-blackness is at an all-time high um and yeah, like I think all of that, it, it, it's, it's all tied back to the way that we've been taught and education is a colonial, uh, a colonial institution for the most parts, both in America and in the, in the Caribbean. So in my practice, like those, those are things that I think I'm grappling with all of the time, but at the same time, not trying to center it just in the heaviness of that. Um, something that I've been thinking about uh, over the last year and some changes, this idea of levity, like how do I move towards that space? Thank you. Um, I, um, from what you said, I think that there is definitely a connection between these um, legacies of colonialism, the xenophobia in the Bahamas and um, uh, these landscapes of waste, so thank you. Also, thank you, Simone. That was a really tough, really beautiful question. Thank you. Um, so we have another question um, from Anita Girvan. To all of you, thank you so much for bringing uh, so much together 
for consideration. May I ask all about Afro-Caribbean and indigenous Caribbean solidarities in relation to how and how your work in the work and the communities of other takes this up? Or is this just a question itself to overdetermined by conditions happening in Canadian Turtle Island context. I recognize my own uh, partial understanding here as a Jamaican diasporic person living in as a settler in spaces that have long pre-contact histories. Sorry, that was a bit long, but I can put this in the chat also. I can uh, speak about that a little in relation to my recent work. Uh, although I've been using a lot of this like superficial um, tropical pattern design that is uh, prolific in like touristic spaces in not only the Caribbean, but in other uh, tropical spaces. Uh, for a while in my work, I started recently designing pattern design um, for applying it specifically for uh, to a series of um, public space installations where I'm wrapping uh, colonizers monuments. Um, and then the patterns, I don't know how, I still haven't figured out how to think about them individually, but so far I'm, I'm, I've been applying it to that. Uh, but the patterns that I've been using for, for that series has been uh, designed by me and kind of in response to this other type of pattern that um, uses the same type of flora, the same type of um, signifiers for many um, different places um, and instead of doing something like that I'm doing research into like uh, ethnobotany which is the, the way that people relate to plants in a local um, space and and also looking into the histories of how um, indigenous and, and afro descending people in in the Caribbean and in the local place where I'm doing the intervention um, have been using plants to um, resist in, in various way uh, the process of colonization. Um, so it's kind of a, a new avenue in my work, but I feel like I'm starting to, to be more um, conscious of this and, and more interested in, in that as a, um, thinking maybe about um, care and, and kind of um, some sort of regenerative experience as opposed to always uh, be meditating on this colonial thing and like, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Okay, so um, we have another raised hand, Cecilia. Yes, hi, hi everyone. Um, I had a question about um, the relationship um, and the connection of the Caribbean. Uh, and as a Francophone coming from like France, but my background is from Martinique, Guadeloupe. And I was wondering um, why the connection with, with uh, the Francophone island is so scarce, so shy, because like many texts and reflections are linked to Glissant, to Aimé Césaire, but finally, in the end, those connections with the artists, with the artistic scene from there, are not really connected. For example, in the programmation, there is none of them. So I was wondering why um, this absence. Thank you. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't get the, the whole thing. Um, I don't know if it was directed to the artist or to the staff, but I just wanted to hear it again. Yeah, for sure. Um, that will be more like general, not particularly for the artists, but um, the notion of the connection with the Caribbean is very important, but I see as a francophone, uh, like an absence of uh, artists from the French Caribbean. So Martinique, Guadeloupe, uh, we have like me like that. And as many reflections are linked to the notion of ref uh, relations, so, mainly glissant that we hear a lot. So I wondered why this connection is so scarce with this part of the Caribbean. Why those islands are very really, really absent most of the time? I want to I want to speak about what Cecilia is saying. I actually understand exactly where you where you come from. It was great that you were able to um, present the question again. Um, and this is something that I'm extremely interested. I think uh, 
first there's something political again between all of the islands in the Caribbean and our identities and how we have been formed, right? Because of that past colonial and parallel um, relations that we have. But um, it is something um, it is something definitely to discuss. And I can speak about myself and my own work. I definitely have revised some of the things that Glissan has wrote, some of the things that Cesare have wrote. I have made tributes to um, their work very explicitly um, in institutional spaces and in the academia, because I think it is essential to understand not only ways of seeing things, ways of relating to, to, to our environment, to our own people, to our own selves as communities beyond everything else. And um, I think their, their, their offerings that they have done um, to the larger discourse has been extremely essential, right? And people like Derek Walcott, for example. So it is something that transpires. I think, um, I don't know if we have had the context in here to be able to speak more directly about our references, for instance, but um, it is something that has been there. In terms of how artists perhaps are represented in this selection, that is something that I think it will be um, more within the curatorial team of the selection um, of the exhibition. But as it regards to my practice, it is something that is that is definitely um, right up there, right? Um, uh, Miss Miss Thompson as well, who have been of reference to um, my understanding of like my own work and how I speak about it. So it is it is it is in there. You know, it just depends on how it depends on the forum and it depends on the questions that we are being asked to bring those things into into the discussion. <laughs> yeah, I I also want to add. Um, thank you for that question. I I think that 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 was a very beautiful observation. I also want to add that um, my my I think I try to speak from a space of duality almost because just as much as I am from the Bahamas, I also think of myself as being very, very culturally Haitian if, if, if the idea of nation um, holds true to whatever that means. Um, and that's a very Francophone um, perspective to, to sort of exist in. And I also like Lionel, uh, I, I, I really think that um, a lot of these series sort of run throughout this work. For instance, something that I've been thinking about in my work is like the right to opacity. Um, and that is like Gleason 101. Uh, because I was making all of this work around the body and using the body in this very literal way and trying to, trying to address um, what it means to be a person in the world in the way that I am. Um, in works prior. And if you look behind me, um, I've been making these abstractions and they come from a very figurative space. I think about them as being figurative drawings, um, figurative drawings, uh, these drawings that were once figurative that are now abstract. And in a lot of ways, I think that is boring again, the language of Gleason. Yeah, I agree with all that too. Like, I think uh, Glissant um, and uh, Franz Fanon and other Martinican thinkers have been like very, uh, Césaire, uh, have been very inspiring to uh, a lot of my work and especially to like put into words an experience that um, even though they frame it as uh, coming from their um, specific experience in Martinique is very Caribbean and it's very like easy to recognize oneself as someone who grew up in a different island into this experience. So I think that's why we're interested in, in those languages because it, it kind of um, is very effective in communicating something that we've also experienced and, and share that interest. Um, and also the colonial condition and like the relationship to these other nations is something very present in their work, which we also can relate to with our respective former colonies, colonial powers, whatever. Um, yeah, and I don't know if the, the curatorial, you know, um, situation, I think Bettina has a raised hand, but um, I wanted to say uh, Montreal is a, is a French speaking place. And I assume it already has a relationship with a, a Francophone Caribbean. And as someone who speaks Spanish and, um, this is my second occasion having the uh, opportunity of uh, showing um, in relation to the context of Montreal. Um, I'm very excited about that because I don't often have that opportunity. So I don't know if that has anything to do with the curatorial situation, but I'm just um, excited about that. Yeah, thank you um, for that question, Cecilia. 
and for the artist as well for your response to it. Uh, I do admit that is a short sight that this um, that this show had. Um, I do, however, think that Jeffrey does live between Anglo and Franco spaces. Um, and I understand that Montreal, there is a vast community of um, Francophone Caribbean people. However, I my French isn't the best and um, I'm trying to work on that. I've only been here for three years. Um, I can understand because of Spanish, but I sometimes think that the art in Montreal has such a vast division between Anglo and Franco. And we try to build that bridge, but somehow our contacts that were Franco-Caribbean kind of fell through or were too busy or things like this. Um, so unfortunately, um, this is a short side of the exhibition and thank you again for posing. And I think it's a very important, um, important, important aspect to recognize that this is a short side of the exhibition and then for future exhibitions, um, it's something I want to keep in mind and I definitely want to keep on learning French here to be able to enter these spaces um, where Francophone Caribbean artists are to better my own curatorial practice. So thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. And also for the artist's answer. And again, this exhibition was very influenced by the writing of Glissant. And as well, I have a lot of influence with both Suzanne Cesar and Amy Cesar in writing. Um, but I do want to extend that to living Franco-Caribbean artists as well, extend these opportunities. And for the future, I will definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. And I think Olivia is from Jamaica, but isn't she, I think she, she operates in, in a French speaking um, circle as well, right? I, I, she's, I know she was um, in the audience, so I don't know if she wants to like write a comment or something, but. Um... No, she left, but yes, that's true. But as Bettina said, like this complexity of the language here, but, but for example, I French and I speak in English and I can speak a little bit of Spanish. So I think the connection it can be possible, but we just have to, like, I think this conversation is this question is to, for that, to give this possibility to say like, there is possibility to do, to create that bridge. Like we have everything here in Montreal, for example, and all the time for me, it's like infuriating to see all the possibilities could be and it's not happening. So I just like, maybe that's why I wanted to ask this question so much. Thank you anyway. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if we, we have more questions. Um, I think this is your last time. <laughs> so let us know. Oh, actually, sorry, I have a question for the curator. Um, okay, this is, in, this is in Spanish, so I'll try to translate. Um, pregunta para la curadora y todos los artistas posibles, la tesis de esta exhibición, así como las propuestas de artistas, podrían extrapolarse a otras zonas costeras o tropicales del mundo. Okay, question to, to the artist and uh, to the curator. Um, the thesis for this exhibition, as well as the proposals of these um, artists, uh, could they extrapolate to other zones, coastal zones or uh, tropical uh, parts of the world? Um, is it okay if I, I go first or? Pues muchas gracias por la pregunta, Donald. Este, entiendo, well, I guess I'll answer in English, sorry. <laughs> I understand that, yes, um, at least like because we are talking about relation with the landscape and relation to water and relation to diverse histories um, that water can hold. Uh, I believe that some parts of this um, thesis can uh, extrapolate themselves to coastal zones or tropic or other tropical areas of the world um, just because of that connection with the landscape and the seascape. However, in the component of archipelagic identity, 
I think it can also be extended to Pacific Islanders, especially. There's a lot of text that um, places in, um, in similarities, especially Elizabeth Delory does this often, between the Pacific Ocean and Oceanic Connections and the Caribbean Oceanic Connections. So that's a very good question. And I think that um, there's like, there are similarities and there's uh, research that can definitely like contribute to this notion of extending coastal and tropical relations more expansive than just the Caribbean. And um, I'll leave this to the artist as well. I think in my work, uh, Labadee, although it, it is specific to the Caribbean and it's something, it's a situation that is very recognizable for people all around the Caribbean. Um, I think because of the things that we discussed when we were talking about tropicalization, how this identity, this tropical identity is, is linked to um, landscape, but we also share in many instances, not everyone in a tropical zone, but a lot of um, other um, islands and other spaces have a similar history of uh, colonization and, and that process and, and um, the relationship to modernity also um, is similar than ours. I think that it would be, I don't know if extrapolate is the word, word, but I feel like if you take this show and you show it in that context, in that country or in um, that community, there will be uh, identifiable um, um, aspects and, and the work is going to speak, speak to them as well. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. I think, um, I think uh, thinking about the zones and thinking about the, the dialogues that can um, happen or that can spark if those works are presented into other spaces is something that, you know, sounds interesting, but it could open up a door for and of possibilities and, 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 and also dialogues and discourses that can um, expand, I think, the, the even, even the interpretations of the work. And I think that is what art does at the end of the day, right? It's, 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 it's right there with a certain symbols, aesthetics, decisions that are being made for people to decode. And I think those are possibilities that can be um, seen. And, and I can imagine a scenario where those dialogues like start happening and spark some sort of like discussion. And it ha has happened presented presenting at least like the series of work that I presented here, the flood aftermath and other hurricane stories to people that are not necessarily related to these environments and um, without also of the tropical zone that we that we are talking about and without the this context of the Caribbean. And it's quite hard to understand what the work is about. And I've been confronted with questions like, you know, is that a canvas that has been painted blue, for instance, or, you know, is, is the image just like, you know, and, and so on, and, and lots of different questions that definitely are based on 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 the perhaps the the lack of that reference. But I think if we are within a certain time zone and within a certain historical past of of colonial imposition and and in other conditions, I think it can open up a door for possibilities that are that are interesting. I I I think I want to echo uh, Giotti specifically with my response here. I think, although when I made this this mouth to mouth, I was really thinking about um, uh, the, the perspective of these phenomenons from a very Haitian Bahamian lens. Uh, the, the, for me, what was interesting was the fact that you can almost uh, replace Haitian or Bahamian with X country, X country, and a lot of the ideas that I was thinking about in the work would still stand true. Um, and really thinking about Kofi Annan and how, how immigration and climate change, those two things, the relationship between those two things is um, uh, the, the biggest threat to the world um, as, as, as a race of people. And really thinking about uh, global production and migration like we really can't separate these things. Um, um, we, we really can't separate those, these things from, from each other. And 
so yeah, I I think this this work could really hold its own, and any of these works could really hold its own outside of any space that they're presented. Uh, I want to say, Lionel, you should uh, see if you could show your work in India. Actually, they have like a, a relationship with this like blue material. There's a, a lot of roofs that are like covered with this. And I don't know if that's as classified as a tropical space, but I was just thinking of like other places where uh, that could be an interesting dialogue, perhaps. I don't know. You're totally right. Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully, let's see. Let's see if something happens in the future. I will welcome those ideas <laughs> and the opportunities as well. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, so we have the last question. Sorry, I said um, that we had the last question about like 15 minutes ago, but I got confused about the timing. Um, so Victoria has her hand raised. Hi, um, and thank you so much, everyone, for the artists, for the curators, for bringing this together, and for all of your comments. Um, my name is Victoria. I'm of Mexican and Finnish descent, and I do work in IT. Um, I've been traveling there for the past 12 years or so. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and I'm actually, uh, my dissertation is on the history and practices of reverse osmosis water. Um, in, in Haiti in the wake of the cholera epidemic. Um, so Jory, your comment about bottled water in the DR really um, really speaks to that. And I'm excited that there's interest there. Um, but I, I'm really curious uh, because um, Leonel, you mentioned that you know water invites or creates this relationship um, with humans and with the environment and with everything and it really mediates, re mediates that relationship. Um, but in this discussion of the sea, I also recognize that the sea is also comprised of salt. And so I'm curious, you know, in your works or in your, how you interact or, or relate to these seascapes, how salt might also arise. Um, I know in Gleason's work as well, he discusses salt uh, quite significantly and has many poems about black salt um, or in his collective work with black salt. So um, yeah, I, I'm mostly just curious and really grateful. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Um, let me see. Uh, so, definitely, definitely, the 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 water in the ocean is very particular, as you mentioned, because of the salt. And there, yeah, there's an understanding um, of that. I think, as it relates to 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 me, I want to tie it up specifically to the work. Um, I like how how this natural process and um, in observing it from a scientific perspective, how you know, like um, salt can be able to be something almost invisible when we're in water and how it becomes something more tangible when it's um, um, in land. And I like the relationships that are observed in those spaces. And in particular, like I have a, I have a, I have an, an installation artwork that is based on this photographic archive. It's called An Speculative Atlas of the Caribbean. And I definitely have used some of the images of like, from of salt banks and um, salt that is deposited into some of the coastal areas and into into plants and to the into the flora, so it is something that I think is 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 intriguing, um, and it's certainly uh, very significant into 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 the way that we perceive this landscape. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but definitely um, it's something that is that is right there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, we have a last question and um, yeah, but I wanted to, to leave space for all of you to share your current projects. So I, there's two questions in this one. So I will um, ask the second one, which is the shortest. Um, how does your work and the exhibition speak to out, to and out, um, with agency, the ability to affect change. Affect change. I think for me, Labadee, um, 
is that kind of answer to, to that industry and and maybe I see it as a way of uh, creating agency for myself in order to like express those thoughts out into the world but also um, through the lens um, thinking about this um, um, people who are on the other side of the fence that don't get to be present in in that dialogue that is happening on this side of the fence I feel like the the lens is kind of trying to um, prioritize the their um, their presence in in how their presence is also disrupting the the fantasies that are main, maintained by this um, enclosed space. Um, that's how I think about agency in in, in that specific work. No, no more answers. Um, Jeffrey, do you have something to add or Lionel? Yeah, I, I can just respond really quickly. I think, I think specifically with mouth to mouth, when I made that installation, I, you know, I, I'm really like, hey, Bahamas government, we really need to figure this out, right? Instead of being xenophobic and, and uh, just writing this off as another bunch of Haitians that drowned in the ocean. How about we really talk about legislation, right? But um, then there's the cynical side of me that's like, I don't know if the art gallery is the route to do that, man. Um, but I also want to add um, with the work that I'm doing now in my practice, uh, this work is also more than two years old. Uh, so the way that I think about agency now is um, through a lens of care and self-awareness and not being so, and care and self-awareness in the sense that uh, the work that I'm interested in right now is about collective speculation and thinking about futurity, right? Because so often when we think, I, I think it's important to, to sort of posit this as like, we, we have a future. It's not just about the things that hurt us in the past, but looking towards um, that space where we'll all be well together. Yeah, and I want to say that in regards to, to the work that I'm exhibiting um, here for C Space Poetics, um, the, the, the moment of like agency, I think I wanted to, um, to, to approach it in a way um, in which perhaps like art historians and people and curators that are writing specifically about contemporary art, like start seeing sideways in regards of like the things that are happening um, in the Caribbean now. Um, and specifically in regards to this work, um, in regards to painting, because I have a very interesting and sort of like um, challenging relationship to what painting is and what painting like is and what is not. And um, I think in terms of that agency is how that representation of like that landscape can change, right? Or can be shifted or can be seen from another, from another perspective Inst instead of like having all of this um, representations of the white sand and the, you know, and the bright beaches or, you know, this idealized perspectives um, that are represented in, 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 the, in painting specifically about the Caribbean landscape can be shifted and can be seen different. And I think that is, that is, that is my goal. And that is a form of like agency that I see with the work. Thank you. Um, so I think we are um, begin, I'm, we're just finishing the, the presentation. So I will hand the mic to Bettina, unless you want to add something else. OK. Um, yeah, so I want to thank all the panelists and Natalia for facilitating this conversation it has been very great to spend this time with you and hear more about your work and your future projects, um, which I think we put in the chat what your upcoming exhibitions are. Um, they might be more up, but I think Alex, if you can put it again so people can reference it back. Um, so 
I also want to thank Anna and Doug from Ford Space for uh, giving us this space and for moderating this, I mean, providing all the technical assistance for this, uh, this conversation. Um, yeah, and also I want to thank the audience for, for coming to this, this talk and staying with us. And I invite you to go to seascapepoetics.com to see all these works in full um and spend time with it and we also have a series of podcasts in the page with other artists that form part of the exhibition in conversation um i want to mention that if we like to close many of these events by placing different um, organizations that help in the caribbean and um, today um simone um, mentioned this organization that helps in the bahamas it's called hands for hunger which is aimed at, um, at um, helping disaster victims, and especially now during the pandemic is very, very um, important to help out if you have the means uh, to end hunger and focusing on reducing waste, uh, food waste in the Bahamas. So yeah, there's the chat. I mean, there's the information in the chat if you wanna donate. Um, but again, thank you all for coming. Um, be sure to sign up for our up upcoming event next Friday at 7 p.m. It's our, it's in the chat right now. Uh, it's going to be a virtual screening with Joy Di um, Minaya, and Olivia McGilchrist, and Deborah Jack. We'll be showing their video work and then a Q&A with the artists speaking about their work. So thank you again so much. Um, so happy to have the four of you in conversation. Uh, it, it was great and very and very much happy for also the audience questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And we didn't get Zoom bomb, so <laughs> great. <Woo. laughs> um, thank you, Bettina, for, for saying all of that. You took the words right out of my mouth, so I'm not gonna necessarily repeat all of my, my thanks, even though we do really appreciate your incredible generosity of spirit here today, your time, energy, and your really thoughtful reflections and ideas. It was a, a nice bit of time to spend together and I'm, I'm glad so many people came and, and chatted and listened and kind of took part in this event. And so I'll just end by reminding you that we have recorded the session and we will share it with you all who signed up for today and um, send, and you can just check it out anytime you'd like. It's gonna be on YouTube. Just look up for Space Concordia University and you'll find us. Um, okay, so we say goodbye. Have a great weekend. Thank you all. And hopefully see you next Friday. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. Bye. 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 Bye.